So not to be the bearer of bad news, but a lot of people die in ERs every single year. A lot of people die in hospitals every year. A lot of people, you know, it's not a great thing. That's probably not a great way to start off a YouTube video too. Now that I'm sitting here thinking about, it. I'm like, they're probably going to be immediately like immediately. No, you cannot talk about this, but a lot of not awesome things happen to humans in emergency departments, right? Uh, a lot of you have sent me the story recently of Alison Holthoff, who was a woman in Canada who passed away in the emergency room after waiting seven hours and no one was listening to her. And it was a huge situation where you're looking and you're reading through it and you're like, why wouldn't you just see her and listen to her? And I was reading through it and I, it's very sad. We're going to talk about it today, but more importantly, what we're going to talk about is kind of going through and seeing what you could do differently. Not that she did anything wrong. She did nothing wrong in this situation, but what you could do to maybe reduce your chances of having something similar happen to you, because we are working within a system that is just, it's messy, right? There's, there's not very, there's not, we're mixing not enough healthcare people with like really burnt out healthcare people with hospitals, not having enough, you know, staff and the healthcare systems themselves being not easily accessible. It's a hot mess, right? It's a hot mess. And we're going to do everything we possibly can do in order to make this horrible tragedy, something that could be potentially avoided when you interact with the healthcare system, because we expect you to kind of know our language, but we don't teach it to you. So that's very rude. So we're going to talk about that today. If you're new, welcome. I'm Liz. I'm a family nurse practitioner. And I talk about you know, nurse practitioner, nursey type things on the internet. And hopefully uh, you walk away with this feeling a little bit more empowered when you, something happens to you that's weird. And uh, you can feel like you can tackle it a little bit more. We're going to teach you the lingo. If you're watching live, hello and welcome. Hello, all the replay people. You're wonderful as well. Let us know how you are this evening. It is, it is, it is a day I went grocery shopping with my children tonight. So we survived. <laughs> we survived. We're here. We're still standing. Nick, yo, thanks for becoming a channel member and supporting what we do here on the YouTubes. I very much appreciate it. We have Mr. Midwife in the chat. Um, Lindsay Smith says, I've enjoyed your streams about other healthcare districts, but surprise, now I get to see my own province here for all the wrong reasons. Yes, this is sad. This does take care to take, take place in Canada, in Nova Scotia. Uh, so, and we won't be focusing as much on like what exactly, um, um, we'll kind of lay out what went wrong here, but not like in the nitty gritty of it. This is a, a huge problem on a big scale, which we'll talk about. But mostly, like I said, I really want to give you the tools to be able to walk away and be like, oh, I know how to avoid, like, at least advocate really well for myself to reduce the chances of having something like this happen, uh, because this is horrifying and it's definitely not what you want your province to be known for. So let us dive right in. Um, and again, this is in no way this person's fault. When you go to the he receive healthcare, you deserve great healthcare. That is where you are listened to and you are respected and you are heard. Uh, that is, that is a lot of the times, not what you receive, uh, in many situations, right? For whatever reasons, a lot of, you know, people go into things with biases. The systems are really overwhelmed, right? We have a multifaceted problem here where one, there's not enough healthcare people that want to work because hospitals treat them like crap, right? And so they're like, well, I'm not going to work here. So you don't have enough healthcare staff. The second problem is, especially in Canada and the US, if you live in a more rural area, there are literally not enough healthcare providers so that you can access primary care in Canada. It's not as much of a cost barrier, right? Because in the U S that's a huge cost barrier where people won't go to their primary care office, they'll wait, and then they'll have to go to the ER, which overburdens the ER, right? Cause we're using the ER then for things like ear infections when we should be using other modalities like primary care or urgent care. But that's a more of a U.S. problem because of the issue getting in, in Canada, just like in the U.S., they have an additional issue of there's primary care providers are paid like crap. So there's not very many of them. So we have the same issue where everything is kind of like shoved and people can't get into primary care because there aren't enough because <laughs> primary care pays like crap. Even though we're the background uh, backbone of the healthcare system and we should be paid more. I feel like I needed like epic music there. It's fine. I don't have it. One day we'll have a soundboard and it'll be a good time. <laughs> And everyone will hate it, but I will love it. Um, so we have that going on. We have issues of, we have an aging population, right? That is, we're keeping people alive a lot longer, which means they're a lot sicker. And so we have more people that need to go to the ER. This is the background, the backdrop of what we have. We also have, you know, a lot, the ER is kind of like the catch-all for, I'm not, you're in a bit of a state of needing help, but we aren't quite sure what to do. Right. So we're going to have you go and go to the ER. Cause it's kind of the catch all. 
So there's a lot of people and not a lot of people who can help. Right. So that is the ugly setting of this backdrop again, nuances because that this happened in Canada, but my friends, this happens all the time in the United States. I it's, I couldn't find like exact numbers of, you know, what we're looking at in the U S but it's having worked in healthcare for a long time. There's a lot of people who are not heard having worked in primary care and having all my patients come back and be like, I went to the ER. They did not listen to me. This happens all the time, which is why I think this conversation is important. Um, so let us see, we have here, um, Allison Holthoff, uh, is the person who this has been like all over and thanks everyone who did tag me in this and asked me to talk about it. Uh, because that's, it's helpful when I get hear from a lot of you of like what you actually want me to talk about. That's how I just like talked, decided to talk about this. Uh, cause I got a lot of requests for it. So here we are. We are here. Um, so Allison Holthoff, a Canadian mom of three died in agony at the Nova Scotia hospital after awaiting medical help in the emergency room for nearly seven hours on new year's Eve. Now that weight in itself in it of itself is not like huge right here, especially to you are going in and sometimes waiting like two days, uh, in order to really get things triaged. Usually, right. The sicker you are, the more you present as sick, the more help you're going to receive, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute of my steps of how I used to coach my patients of how to tell people in an emergency or even when you're not that sick of how you are feeling so they can assess it the best, right? So that you can hopefully get triaged appropriately and get, you know, pushed up in the line if you should be. Gunter, uh, Holthoff told reporters earlier this week that his 37 year old wife, Allison had woken up on December 31st, complaining of what she thought was an upset stomach. Uh, also no upset stomachs are the start of a lot of things. Cause your gut is when you're very connected to like your gut and your kidneys, man. And your kidneys are like back pain, like on your flank. Those are some of the like very early warning signs of your body's just angry. It's angry at you and it would like help. Uh, so don't always blow that up. Okay. He said, Allison had fallen off her horse back in December and had been recovering or suffering from pain ever since throughout the day, her condition deteriorated. And after taking a bath, she ended up in pain on the floor. They went into the hospital about 11 AM. He had to carry her into the building on his back. So obviously we're short staffed, right? If we can't even get people help them out of their cars and get them into the hospital, we're in some kind of a situation where we're probably short staffed. Husband got a wheelchair, took her into the emergency room and she was struggling to sit up because of excruciating pain. I told the triage nurse and the lady uh, behind the desk that it was getting worse and she wasn't doing good and was in pain. Um, we don't know exactly what they, what he said in that interaction. Like I said, uh, we will be going over exactly what to say kind of, if you are in that will help amplify that message and maybe would get it heard better to a nurse. Again, he did nothing wrong here. This is you should be able to go in and say, I'm in excruciating pain, please help me. And to be heard and actually have people do interventions. But just to be totally straight with you, that's not always the world we live in, right? Sometimes people are going to assume that you are, uh, just trying to get pain medicine maybe, or you are just trying to, you know, get in the doors so that you have, uh, you know, somewhere that you can just be for a minute. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to assume a lot of things about you in the emergency room. Uh, and that's not fair. It is also the reality of the situation that we are in at the moment. Right. Uh, so the hospital took, um, Allison's blood and urine, which her husband said proved difficult because she was in so much pain by then. Uh, Allison was instructed to sit in a waiting room, but her condition worsened to the point that she had to lie on the floor in fetal position. Uh, this is when I remind you that it's always good to have someone else with you so they can really be your advocate. She had someone with her. Um, and we, again, we don't know the details of all of this. This is just a situation you hear of a lot, right? That you, someone was assessed, they kind of got blown off. They were like, Oh, you know, like this person's probably just being like extra, uh, you know, you silly woman and go sit down. Um, and things are getting worse and worse. Um, and they're just, you know, people are not being listened to as they waited for a doctor to see Allison security guards brought over some blankets to cover up and a cup of water. It was then that his, she started to say, I think I'm dying. Don't let me die here. Um, also a massive, uh, trigger warning. If you don't want to hear about anything traumatic now, now's the time to leave. <laughs> Maybe I'll leave a, uh, timestamp of when we get past the, uh, uh, just to where you can hopefully learn Oh, dear, a way to communicate that would present a sense of urgency more again, not that you should have to do that, but here we are, here we are. And this is why, we, <laughs> uh, uh, um, 
Holtoff said you went to the nurse's desk five times, uh, which is a lot telling staffers, his wife was feeling worse. He said, one of the nurse asked him if Allison was always like this. Uh, and again, I'm not going to pretend that this does not happen, right? This, uh, after working in healthcare for a decade, uh, there are a lot of good people in healthcare and there's just a lot of mm, people in healthcare. There are words we can say that will make people more alert and listen more and perk their ears up a little more, which we will cover. Um, and then it sounds like her eyes started rolling her back in the head, uh, into the back of her head, which made them ask, is she on drugs? So we're assuming a lot of things about people, right? Uh, to which he said, no, uh, hold off. Um, and then the person again said, Hey, I feel like I'm dying. Um, and then at around 6 PM, after about seven hours after they arrived at the hospital, she started screaming. The nurses came out to check her vitals and found that her pulse was really high and her blood pressure was low. So that is indicating probably, you know, that can indicate a lot of things we're going to find out it's because she was losing a lot of blood into her abdomen. Um, that's when they started to pay attention to her. Uh, they came out and they got her all hooked up. They did an EKG. They did an x-rays. Um, she started to say like, I can't breathe. Um, this is really like, she ended up coding. It was, it sounds absolutely horrific. Uh, they tried to resuscitate her. They did a CT scan at this point, realized her abdomen is full of blood, but they don't know where it was coming from. Um, and they ended up not doing surgery because they thought this is, you know, nothing is going to change the outcome here. Um, and she passed away and that is horrifying. Right. And this is something that could have been very, very preventable had they just like listened better. Right. Um, and it's so beyond frustrating, and I'm not trying to just come out and say that, I mean, they should have listened to her. Right. Uh, but we're, again, we're also in a situation that we have a healthcare system that is so overwhelmed and the ER is the catch all for everything that, you know, and this is not to be like, Oh, this is all fine. It's just looking at it to say this, the ER probably sees it's hard to eventually differentiate when someone comes in and says like, I'm in pain, blah, blah, blah. I can see how it happened really easily, which never makes it okay. Right. Um, so, uh, like everyone is saying, yeah, just take a second and like actually listen to your patients. Um, uh, we'll see said if she was triaged appropriately at, um, she was probably triaged appropriately. Obviously it sounds like it started at nursing orders already. She should have been reassessed every two hours though. Uh, yeah. And, we don't have all the details on this. This I kind of wanted to bring in as this is happening and it happens all the time, not to be, <laughs> you know, my normal cup of cheer. Um, this is an issue, right? And we can't go in and we can't change the healthcare system, right? Obviously. I mean, we can try, we can vote on all the things and be like, Hey, we need to, uh, you know, prioritize preventative healthcare so that people there's less overwhelm in the ERs and they're not catching all of everything. And we can, uh, come in and support other social systems so that it's not the catch all for everything psych related. And it's not, you know, other people have a place to go other than the ER. Yes. All of those things. Um, but we can't change that like immediately, but I'm hoping that I can really quickly give you some language to make it very clear when you're interacting with the healthcare system that you need help. And this is why, and this is why it's different because it can also be hard as a healthcare provider, uh, to like know what, if the patient's not giving a good history, right. And we don't know, they might've given a perfect history and this still would have happened. I'm just generalizing from other experiences I've had. If you don't have someone who's very good at describing their symptoms, it can also be difficult amidst chaos, right. Uh, depending on how, what else was going on in this ER, it can be difficult to sift through and be like, oh yes, this is something I really do need to pay attention to versus like, oh, you know, this is a different situation that requires less urgent of everything. You know what I mean? Um, because there is a lot of that as uh, crappy on the other side of that as there is, is not everyone, many people, many, many people who land in the emergency department can make a make it can get, I don't want to say anything because then everyone goes mad. There are people who end up in the emergency department who are there for reasons that are not a true emergency. 
uh, but they can make it present like one. Right. And that doesn't mean that they don't deserve care and all the other things. It just makes it very difficult to differentiate. Um, please don't let me die here is a very uh, clear. If patients are telling you they're dying, it's usually true. Okay. I can't even tell you the number of times where patients, I would come in on my shift at night when I work night shift and they're like, I'm going to die. And I'm like, you're not going to die. You're like, you're going to go home in like a day. And then sure enough, <laughs> didn't go well for them. Um, but that's kind of, that's where we're at. Right. Um, Scott's here. Scott's can give us some insight. Um, it's, it's a, it's a whole situation. Um, Aaron, if you guys work in the ER, let me know what you, what your, what your hospital kind of does in terms of this. Do you round on people all the time? Um, what, what is your sense of this whole, like, what is, does this happen at your hospital? Essentially you can, I mean, that might be difficult to say because you might not want to talk about it, but, um, like Corey Jackson says, former ER nurse. Yes. Lots of people say they're dying in the waiting room, but every ER I've worked in required assessments on everyone in the waiting room every hour. That's very nice. Uh, I know of many hospitals that do not require that, but I think that's a good general rule of thumb. Uh, Aaron MB says to go to the nurse's station five times and the person just brushes you off like that would be so rough to her husband. Oh, this whole thing would be awful. Cause it sounds like he does raise a ton ton, a ton of alarms and they just like brushed them off. And again, I wish this was rare, but it's, I know it's not because I had patients all the time who would come back to me and I had to immediately send them back to the ER after coaching them of what to say. So the message would get across clear. And then I would be on the phone with the ER person, the usually an ER doctor. And I'm like, why, why did you send them away? And they're like, Oh, I thought they were like, just, you know, trying to get something from me. I'm like, uh, deep breaths, Liz, don't deep breaths, deep breaths, deep breaths. Um, it's a mess. Renee said, we call this walking, talking, then dead. Seriously unacceptable that she didn't get the proper triage. It's absolutely unacceptable. And it's horrifying that it happens so often. Uh, Yunil Castillo says, I've noticed day shift uh, leaves a lot of the admissions for night shifts and they focus more on discharges. This is just a, you know, that, that happens a lot. You know, everyone tries to get what they can done. Um, it's a, it's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. Um, it is super tragic, Bridget. I agree. Um, it is very, very sad. Uh, Sally said the sad thing about the overcrowding situation is that many PCPs tell patients to go to the ER because they have no available appointments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's if you have a primary care provider, a lot of people don't right. Or they can't access one. And, uh, very yikes. Um, and says, I feel like I'm dying over here and I think I'm dying. Please don't let me die or very different things. A compassionate nurse would be able to tell the difference. The latter is usually true. Yes, I totally agree. So a good first lesson for everyone who does work in healthcare is if people say something like that, listen to them, uh, and just listen to people, right? Look at them, really look at them. You can usually tell by looking at someone, how things are going. It makes, it's just completely, horrifying that this person had to, um, deal with this, right. Completely horrifying. Um, so let's go through really quick. And I want to just share how I tell my, how I used to tell my patients in primary care to describe situations like this so that it was made abundantly clear. And then if you lay out a clear picture, there is a bigger likelihood, right. That, you are going to be heard and you're going to be triaged appropriately, right? Uh, because it can be a mess. Uh, you shouldn't have to do this. Granted, you should not have to, but here we are. So I always told people when you are going to interact with the healthcare system, um, that you need to treat it like an investigation, right? And when we're in an investigation, what do we want to know? We want to know the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why, right? Yes. Those are all of them. Who, what, where, why, when? Sure. That order is fine. Uh, it's just like plain clue. Okay. Our very first one we have is who. So we need to, when you're going in and presenting in the emergency department or in your doctor's office, tell me who is hurting you. Okay. Is it your stomach? Are you barfing a lot? Are you pooping your brain out? Is it your foot? Is it your head? Do you have a headache? Is it your thumb? What is the, what is the source? Do you think of your problem. First, that's a good first line to start with. Hi, I'm Liz and my head is hurting me. Right. But that's not very, that's where a lot of people will stop and they'll be like, I have a headache. We can't stop there, friends. That does not give the urgency or enough of a picture in order to triage you appropriately. And as we're learning, people might not ask a lot of questions, which might lead to some really severe issues. Right. Uh, as we've seen. 
Our next question is what, what does it feel like? I want you to then describe to them. Okay. So we've given our, you know, who we think the problem is. I I think we are having issues with the headache in the parlor. Okay. Um, what is the issue? What does it feel like? I want you to give a pain scale, right? I, you can use a zero to 10 one, usually zero or one being like, this is totally fine. 10 is like awful. Uh, you can rate it on, Oh, this is kind of just bothersome all the way to like, I am in blinding pain. I can't think of anything else. Give them something to hook it to, right? Be like, this hurts worse than when I had a baby, like unmedicated labor. This hurts worse than unmedicated labor. This hurts worse than when I had a kidney stone, giving them something to like anchor that pain to. This is the worst headache of my life. That's a statement that should get attention, right? You're helping people decide how severe this is so that you can hopefully get their attention. And you're showing them like, I'm comparing this to other things, right? Uh, And then we are going to want to use descriptive words. Now, this is where I generally see that at least when patients have talked to me, we run into some issues because they say it just hurts. I'm like, well, what kind of hurt is it? Because we have a lot of different hurts, right? We have, ouch, this just hurts versus trying to match a descriptive word with it, like cramping, stabbing, dull, sharp, grating, pulsing, anything you would like to use. Just sit there and be creative for a moment and decide what kind of pain it is. This will also help differentiate. Uh, I have had this be very successful with patients when they give a very concrete example of the type of pain they get listened to in the ER more. Right. And I don't know if that's just ERs I've interacted with, but when they said something different than it just hurts, like when they were like, oh, it's just like sore, like it hurts the people were kind of like, yeah, yeah, it hurts. And they were much more likely to be blown off than if they were able to give a very detailed description, which is again, why we're going over this. Um, so that's our, what is, what does it feel like? Give them a scale. Where are we on terms of like how this relates to other pain and use really descriptive words. Okay where now we need to tell them, where does it hurt? Does it originate from somewhere or is it absolutely everywhere? Usually in more like acute situations, um, you know, it's in my stomach. It's right here. You can kind of point to it. Is it on both sides? Uh, where does it go? Cause sometimes pain travels, right? If you're having something, say you're having, I don't know, kidney stones and it's going up and you're like, it's in my bag, but it's also in my shoulder it's traveling. Uh, that's very helpful to know. That's going to, again, give you more details, which makes people for, you know, apparently in, we have to prove a lot of the times what our situation is. So there's our, where be really specific about that. And then why, like, do you know what, ha- why it happened? Did something happen right before this? And now all of a sudden you're like, oh yes, I was hit over the head by my child who was wielding, um, an ax. Yes, that is, that did happen right before my head started hurting. So like, that's a event that would be good to know. Um, is anything else going on that we should like know about? Did you have surgery recently? Give us a little bit more of the why, why did you, um, other whys that are good to include are why did you come now? versus yesterday? Why, what made you get up off your couch and come into this emergency room or come into my office to kind of, that will again, give them a comparison of like, you were like, and give them an idea of what's happening, right? If you're like, I came now because I feel like I'm going to die. Okay. That is a very different situation versus, you know, I came now because I had time. Then we can assess that. Okay. It's probably important still, but maybe less severe, right? And I like people to tell them why they're worried. What are you worried about is happening here? I am worried I am dying. That's a serious situation. I am worried something has busted open inside of me and this is um, happening. I'm worried I'm having a stroke. I'm worried I'm having X, Y, and Z. That will also help focus down and kind of give them an idea of not necessarily what it actually is, but like what the concern level is, right? Um, And then ending up with when. When is this happening? Is this an always type of thing that's happening? Are you always itchy like this? Are you always in pain like this? Is it constant? Does it come and go? Is this something that started yesterday, right? Like when did this start? How long has this been lasting? If this is someone coming in being like, I woke up this morning, it's gotten so much worse. Now I can't move. And I feel like I'm going to die. That should set off every red flag you own as this is a problem versus I fell off my horse in September and it's sort of been hurting since then, you know, now it's like gradually getting worse. I finally came around. I had time today, different story, right? 
Um, and then when is it worse and when is it better? When does anything make it worse or better? Is this better at night? Is this better when you lay down? Is this better after you've eaten? Does eating make it worse? Does it make it better? And that gives you the constellation of being able to tell a really good descriptive story of what is hurting, where it is, um, what type of pain is it kind of, why are you showing up now? What changed? Why, uh, what could have happened? You know, why is this happening in the first place? And then all the timing things like around it, if that makes sense, right? This is something we actually learn in, um, when you, you know, go to school, uh, they're teaching you, these are all the questions that they should be asking you. Um, but they obviously sometimes probably don't. And it's helpful if you are able to kind of collect your thoughts around it and present it in that way. Not that this will solve everything, but my friends, I was trying to figure out a situation within this story to make it like an educate, not just like a, well, this happened and it's awful and there's no hope. I wanted to offer you like something right? Something so that it would be like, well, maybe if I'm ever in a situation like this, I at least have some kind of equipment to maybe be able to handle it. Right. Um, so that is the situation. That is what we have going on here. I'm going to go back and look at a bunch of comments. What are your thoughts? Uh, obviously this is awful. This should not have happened to this person. Um, if you work again, like in the ER, do you see how this could like happen again? I can see how it would happen. I know many people who they, you go, they go in and they're in pain and they immediately get labeled as drug seeking. I cannot tell you, like I said, the number of times I have then had to call the ER back and be like, I know, <laughs> no, my dude, um, they are there for a legitimate reason. They're like, Oh, I just thought they were like trying to come in and get like drugs. I'm like, oh, deep breaths, Liz, deep breaths. Um, this happens all the time, like I said, and it's awful. Um, one, uh, nurse Scott said, so nurse Scott works in the emergency room. Uh, one thing I can say is that a severe pain is a significant sign that should bump you up. Agree. Second, the triage nurse should have palpated the patient's abdomen quickly for tenderness. That would have alerted her. Yeah. It sounds like the, uh, this was also a situation where the hospital was, they did many things wrong. Like this is not, that's why I didn't even want to do like a deep analysis of this. Cause they obviously didn't assess this person very well. They weren't really look, I don't think you can look at someone who is, uh, I've seen people pass away this way. And they don't look okay, right? They don't look comfortable. They look like they are about to pass away. I don't think they, I mean, that's why I was like, it's not even worth diving into what the hospital didn't do because they didn't do anything right. Uh, and then of course you just have to also keep in the back of your mind, was this just gross negligence or was this, this is a symptom of the hospitals being so full and so packed that as we've been screaming from the rooftops, especially lately on this channel, like when you don't have enough people, things like this get missed, right? And you're going to write it off as something else. So grassroots RN said, this is why having an experienced nurse in triage is so important. Exactly. And if you don't have experienced nurses because they're all leaving because hospitals would rather pocket all of the money, uh, because you know, uh, greed, uh, and you, or you just don't want to treat people well, um, in Canada, I know it's just, uh, it's just like a mess of, you know, people it's kind of the same thing. They don't get treated well enough. Uh, it's a rural, like this was, I think a rural area. So there's always less people there. If we don't have nurses, especially experienced nurses, cause then all the experienced ones quit, uh, they aren't going to know to look for these things. Right. Um, sometimes there are subtleties in clinical presentation that require advanced skill to identify quickly. Yes. True. Um, Nurse Scott says for your paramedic and nurses, you can use, um, uh, PQRST, uh, for assessing pain. Um, MSA says where I tell people to point to with one finger to where the worst pain is, and then use that finger to show me how that moves. I like that. That's excellent. So this is good for helping them pinpoint it. I had a, um, the people would sometimes, uh, show them on like themselves. Sometimes I would bring out, like I had a diagram that they could like point to. And I would say the same thing. I'm like, you have to pick one spot. I'm like, where is it the worst? And they would point there because people, um, but yeah, having them point with one finger. I like that. I like having them point at themselves. I had people all the time. They were like, couldn't do it on themselves, which is why I moved to the diagram. Cause they're like, it's just everywhere. And they're, I'd be like one you know, point to where it is. And they're like here. I'm like, that's, 
I don't know if you got the point of this question, but yes, I very much like that method. Um, we, um, uh, take them. Yeah. Grassroots are incense patients. When patients say this is the worst phase I've had in my life, I don't want to die. Or I am afraid take them very seriously. Take them like so seriously, so seriously. If those words come out of their mouth, worst pain I've ever had in my life. Red flag. We don't like that. Uh, worst pain. Like I can't see anything where you're, they're saying like, this is the worst I've ever had it. And then can kind of give you a description with different words. Very bad. Just not good at all. Sam said this incident happened in my province. We were in a healthcare crisis. A woman presented with jaw and arm pain and waited seven hours. Still, she left and had a massive heart attack an hour later and died. That's so sad. Um, some ERs in Nova Scotia have a 24 hour wait to see a physician. This is so sad. I was looking into this of, uh, why that is in that area. And it's a huge shortage of like primary care. So the, over -E like the ERs are super overwhelmed because the ERs are except like taking on everything. And then even there's not enough ER people, like people to go and work in the ER, right? Uh, it's a mess. It's a, we are turning into a situation where it's like, oh, we prioritized all the specialties, right? In especially in like, no one wants to go into primary care because it, it's just a lot. Uh, it's my baby and I love it, but it spit me out. Uh, they don't pay you well. It's the, like the least paid specialty and you do the most work, like in my humble opinion, because you're, you know, trying to put all the puzzle pieces together for everyone and you're doing all the paperwork. You're not paid at all. You're at the least paid. So why would you go into it? Right. Or the people who do, who are like me, you're like, Oh, this is my life's passion. And then three years into it, you're like, I need to leave. I need to leave. <laughs> I need to leave quickly exit. Um, the emergency room is also not like wildly well-paying. Uh, all the specialties are is where all the money is. Mm -hmm. And then we wonder why no one wants to go and do these things. And that is just, I'm sorry. That is just very sad that your province is dealing with that. Um, we have a huge, huge issue with that in the United States as well, especially in rural areas where there's just nothing. Um, Janet said this woman was an excruciating pain when she went to the ER to the point of having to lie down in the fetal position in the waiting room. She couldn't collect exactly collect thoughts. And I'm not blaming her at all. Like I said, she deserved to be listened to. This was just to say, if you find yourself in this situation, I can't fix your healthcare system, but I can offer you this. I don't, I mean, obviously she, if you're in this bad of pain, like you should be listened, you should be listened to no matter what. This is not in any way to blame her. This is I feel powerless. I don't want to just share this sad story on the internet and provide you with nothing. There's no way this person, if someone is saying they said all the things, right? She's literally in fetal position. She was having all these things. They're obviously assuming that she's a drug addict, uh, and being dramatic by asking, is she always like this? And then, um, <laughs> uh, you know, is she on drugs? Clearly we had a lot of bias going into this. Um, I don't think they were looking at her objectively in any way, shape or form. And this is not to say, Oh, you should have handled. No, you said everything you needed to say, which was, I feel like I'm dying. Uh, <laughs> this is awful. They just didn't listen to her. My thing was just to say, I don't know what else to do. So I will show you this and hope that if you're ever in a situation and you can articulate pain, it's here. Um, it can be helpful to always, like if you have someone with you who can help you articulate that as well, when you get to the point where you no longer can, that can be helpful, but that's not an option for everyone. Will C says, I wonder if the outcome would have been different uh, if she came in with EMS. It might've been, I don't, I mean, they might've been able to, so EMS is like emergency medical services. I don't know if they would have been able to communicate that better, give a better report, right. To the healthcare people who then would have, they probably at least would have had more like her vitals and been like, Oh, like this girl is, <laughs> that is not good. Like that does not, you know, they would have maybe assessed her, maybe touched her, uh, you know, felt her stomach and been like, wow, that's like, I would assume it's pretty hard. If it's filled with blood. Right. And been like, this is, this is probably a problem. Um, uh, Sam said, Joanne, people in Nova Scotia are waiting hours for an ambulance, literally hours. It would not have helped. Um, that's true. If your ambulance ride tapes absolutely forever, then that's not helpful. Nurse Scott said, sometimes it does help, but there are those who call 911 because they think it will get them in. If you come in by ambulance for something minor, you will go out to the waiting room. So yeah, you're not everyone, you know, that's not a magic pill in, uh, our, that's how the ERs I've worked. Like I never worked in the ER, but you could, you knew who was going in by ambulance and we were kept appraised of that. 
a lot of them just went straight to the front. Like they just took them up to the front door and you kind of got admitted just like a normal person, unless, uh, you know, you were, something was very, very wrong and said many parts of the U S are only a step away from this kind of crisis. Many are in this type of crisis. People sometimes blame socialized healthcare, but I think it has a pretty universal problem. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's a very, very universal problem. This is a huge, huge crisis in the United States because, uh, we have the same exact issues, uh, are over ERs are like totally overwhelmed. A lot of people never even, they don't have, they don't even go because they're worried like that. Then we enter a whole different layer of like a lot of people in the U S don't even go, uh, because they are in the back of their mind. They're like, Oh, this might like, what if I'm being dramatic, me going to the ER is going to cost us like more money than we have. Uh, so I had a lot of patients that, uh, died, um, to be very honest, because they didn't go to the emergency room because they took the gamble of what if I'm wrong and what if this isn't as serious as I think it is. And then I bankrupt my family, right? Because a lot of people live on with, you know, if your deductible is $8,000, not very many, like a lot of the country lives without $8,000. Right. And so that's a very real thing that a lot of people do. And it's very sad. And, uh, I'm laughing only because I'm thinking like, I'm like, wow, I'm such a fun <laughs> person to bring to me on an internet or at a party with, um, as I bring all of this information, MSA said, it does sound uh, like the assessment and triage failed this person hard. She was bleeding out at a certain point. She had skin changes, vital sign changes, pain, all of that. Yeah. Oh, this hospital completely failed this person. Um, it's an absolute, absolute mess. Uh, and again, just wanted to bring it up. A lot of people were like, Oh, are you going to talk about it? Talk about it. Yes. Um, try to offer whatever help I can, which is <laughs> here's how I would love for you to be able to present in triage. Should you have to do this? No. Should you be able to come in and, you know, be able to just say, Hey, I, this like really hurts. Let's have a look at it and have it evaluated. Yes. That's not the world we live in as we can see, which is horrifying. And again, it's no one's fault if you can't go in and articulate what kind of discomfort you're in super duper well, because you're uncomfortable. And that's the last thing you can do is like be super clear headed about it. Right. Uh, I was neurotic and made all of my patients. I always gave them like handouts when they first, uh, you know, would come into the office. I'm like, here's how I want you to go. If you ever feel like bad, um, keep this in your purse. And it's a handout of exactly how to present all of your symptoms. It's like fill in the blank. Here we go. Uh, so that you can be heard. I developed that after I had dealt with situations like this where people would go and then they miss terrible things and bad things happened. And I was like, this is not good. We do not like this. Um, we don't like this. Uh, so that's where I am. All right. I'm going to scroll back and see what comments we have here. Um, but yeah, this is very, very sad. I hate that this is the situation that this person was in. Um, I can't imagine having to be that husband now and live knowing that like, you know, what if I could have done more? He couldn't have done more. He did like everything he could have. He was going up and being like, Hey, hello. Uh, what else can you really do that? You know what I mean? But like, I'm sure he's living with a ton of guilt. Um, it's a mess, right? It's an absolute, absolute mess. Um, I see a lot of comments of like, oh, you know, the solution that's usually proposed for like our super messed up system here in the U S is like having a different type of like socialized healthcare system. It's a very, we can have a, that conversation like a different day, not all health, like universal healthcare options are created equal. Uh, I think there are, so we don't have to have Canada's, right? Uh, we don't have to have Canada's if we don't want to. There are many other countries that do it well. Um, maybe Canada, like maybe Canada doesn't do it well. Maybe it's this, this province, right? Cause each province kind of gets to decide its own thing, but don't write off that entire like concept of healthcare just because one province did it crappy. That's why I was not going to talk about this entirely was because I was like, Oh my gosh, like anytime something bad happens in a different country, that's immediately what everyone jumps to. They're like, wow, this is socialized healthcare. And that's what you want. I'm like, I've seen more people die than I ever care to because of our garbage system that says, if you don't have money, you don't have healthcare. So no, don't even, don't even talk to me. <laughs> don't even, we don't, uh, don't even. Um, so that's a story for a different day. I don't have the emotional capacity to, uh, 
<laughs> I don't have the emotional capacity to go there right now. I'm in a burn it all to the ground mood. Um, this is very sad. Emily Miller says, this is very nice of you. I hope they used it. They did. And then I, uh, <laughs> I had a lot of people, I made a lot of copies and people like took it to their friends. It was very cute. I'm thinking of making a, uh, some kind of like a thing that I would distribute to where like you could, patients could buy it. It would be like a tiny little journal and it would be like a medical type journal of like, just how to lay out different healthcare concerns, how to describe different healthcare, like kind of like a guide to like healthcare, it would be pretty cheap and people could buy it. And then I could try to like donate other copies to like healthcare centers, because I feel like that's a huge issue that patients have a lot of the times is how to just communicate to the healthcare system, what is going on, how to keep track of it. Uh, all of that. Um, that's a pipe dream. That's one of the things that it's like in the back of their mind. Cause a lot of my patients did like that, right. They liked the, I gave them a lot of weird handouts. They were, a lot of them were very overwhelmed, um, <laughs> very overwhelmed with my paperwork. And then they would come back later. Can I like, can I have more of those forms? <laughs> I need to I went to the ER. I need more forms. I'm like, yes, all of my handouts that you thought I was crazy. <laughs> Three years later, they'd come back and they were like, Liz, you're not as crazy. You're crazy, but you know, <laughs> I like it. Um, uh, Sally said we walk, had a walk-in clinic in our ER that worked well and did considerably decrease the emergency patients. Unfortunately, new admin deemed it unnecessary. And this is the stuff that's just like infuriating because we, there are systems that then you're like, oh, this would help. Like having a kind of like an urgent care within the ER, right? Um, and then they were like, well, that doesn't make us very much money, right? You're only billing that as a what? Because emergency room visits are going to have a way higher billing code if you're doing procedures and such, right? Versus treating it like in urgent care. And then they kind of are hoping that the urgent care people like, I don't know, leave, die. Who knows? They don't care. <laughs> they just want more money. Um, yes. Uh, MSA said, yes, make it like a flip book with laminated covers. Um, make it, we'll buy it all help design the pregnant people and we'll have a Spanish version. I love it. Um, yeah, I have a whole, whole concept idea for this little thing. Cause it combines, it's basically, it's all the different worksheets I would give my patients to keep track of these poor people. They came to boot camp. <laughs> like, First appointment. I'm like, welcome. I we're going to get your life organized. Right. Cause patients came in all the time. And they were, um, they were like, I have like 12 doctors. I don't know what medicine I'm on. Uh, everything hurts. I don't know when that started. And I can't tell if I'm depressed or if it's just today. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> we're going to get your life organized. I have 12 handouts for you. We're going to get through this. I was like, I should probably just like combine that. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Um, and most, some of them were like, I never want to see you again. <laughs> probably half of them. They were like, that was too much, too much. And the other ones were like, I'm here for the worksheets. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Um, but I think it would be helpful, right. To just help people figure out how to communicate. Uh, Carly's also exhausted by the socialized healthcare system conversation. Me too, friend. Like, do we really need to keep proving that like you, just because you're a human, like you're human, you should be able to have healthcare, but that's, you know, the <laughs> Oh, I can't, I cannot, I just cannot. Um, and yikers. Um, <laughs> Mr. Bidoy, she does cleave classes in session. Now this is my very disorganized classroom. Okay. Friends. Welcome. 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 Um, this is that I would never, uh, do you teach? I don't teach, uh, I work at like a nursing education company, like Turio. If you're like in nursing school, uh, I do like some, uh, soft skills. I teach some soft skills there. Mostly I just help, uh, with like the marketing stuff though. Um, I don't teach formally because I don't like rules. I don't like catty, uh, grumpy, mean, mostly ladies who run nursing schools and, uh, you know, are just the worst. Uh, I don't do well when I'm told like what I have to do and what line I have to tow. So no, <laughs> No, we don't do that. I also say a lot of things that get me, you know, the people are like, you can't say that. And I'm like, I don't like you to tell me what I can say. So I don't think any school would want to touch me with a 12 foot pole. Uh, <laughs> so here we are. Yeah. Adgum, welcome to nursing school. I mean, your yearly wellness visit. <laughs> oh, that's how I was. Um, but yes, uh, you know, that was very kind of you to say, um, uh, 
but I do rant, rant on the internet. So that's, this is where my home is. <laughs> this is where we are. Um, we have that. Uh, Amelia said, uh, see how to not have symptoms dismissed as anxiety due to age and gender was in a tripod position, gasping, grabbing chest, um, talk, told to calm down, go home, beg for a chest tan, chest CT had a massive bilateral PEs, heart failure and was dying. Well, that is traumatic and horrible. And I am sorry. Um, really the only thing that I can give you with that is kind of what we went over of being as specific as possible. Uh, really laying out an entire picture, being really specific of the timing when it comes to anxiety and stuff. Uh, I think the most helpful thing that I heard from my patients, at least, cause again, I've never worked in the ER, but this is kind of, I would, does it shock you to know I would, I interrogated them, uh, when they, whenever they had interactions. Um, and I'm sorry you had this one and I hope you're doing much, much better now. Uh, cause this is just like horrible. And this happens again, like all the time, right. Where people are just not listened to and things are missed and they're discharged home and things might not end great. With anxiety, especially being able to say, I know what anxiety feels like. I know what a panic attack feels like. This is different. And this is why, uh, normally I can catch my breath. I cannot catch my breath. Normally I, you know, have my anxiety feels like this, and this is why it is different. Uh, that's really the best way I can tell you of how to differentiate it is to link it. Remember when we said kind of like, what does it feel like? Um, that goes back to linking it to something that is, um, something else that you have experienced. Um, Oh, there we go. Uh, something else you've just, you've experienced so that it kind of like grounds it right? It gives it something to correlate it to. So they might know, okay, this isn't just like when you've had anxiety before. Um, you know what I mean? And going from there, uh, words that people don't like in general, or I feel like I'm going to die. We covered that one. Um, things like worst pain of my life, red flag, immediate red flag, uh, in, you know, anytime you're, uh, like you really can't catch your breath. You're spitting up blood. You are having any, I don't know, like just don't be afraid to be very adamant about your symptoms and let them know what you're worried about. I'm worried this is something more than a panic attack, right? I'm worried that this is something more than this. And then if you still feel blown off, be like, I feel like you're blowing me off. Like, it's okay to just say that. Uh, I have said that in different situations for my family members, um, of, I feel like you're not hearing me. And I think that's a really, it can be a really powerful statement of just like, I feel like you're not hearing me and you're blowing me off. And I'm really worried about this. I am very worried. This is what I'm worried about. And sometimes just like recentering people that way can be helpful and making them be like, okay, like that can occasionally get your people's attention so that they listen to you and hear that, you know, they're not feeling heard, uh, and just practice those words. You know what I mean? Like practice. I think this is a good, uh, thing for everyone to practice. I have had to practice this because even working as a primary care nurse practitioner in like every day, this is what I did when something happened to my own children that I felt like was not being handled appropriately by people who were like specialists. I felt very insecure and like, uh, like I could not speak up about it. I'm like, Oh, well, like they're, they're fancier and more important than me. And I'm not, I shouldn't, I should just like, I should just let it go. And I'm glad I didn't because it was something that needed to like be looked into, but it was hard to say, I feel like I'm not being heard. Uh, this is, you know, I feel like I'm not being heard. Why do you think that it's not this? And that's another good thing you can always ask is why do you not think, why do you, why are you not more concerned? Like what, what makes you not concerned? And it makes them say their thought process out loud to you, right? It makes them say, 
because they really might have legitimate reasons, right? They might be like, Hey, so I'm not worried that you're having this because we did this x-ray and it was okay. If it wasn't, if it was, you know, X, Y, and Z, this would show this, we did this blood work. It came back totally fine. If you were having this, I would expect your blood work to have shown this. It makes them stop and really think about it. Uh, and I found it super duper helpful when my patients told me those things and asked me those questions, like, why weren't, why aren't you, you know, they would come in, they're like, my foot is broken. And, you know, we'd play around, we'd feel it. And I'd be like, I am not worried your foot is broken. Um, and then some of the wonderful humans would be like, if I didn't, you know, explain, which you always should have explained to you why it's not worried. Like, they would be like, well, why? And I'd be like, oh, that's a really great question. Let me tell you why I'm not, which can reassure people a little like, Hey, this is why it's not. So always ask, let them know. I don't feel like I'm being heard. Um, can you explain why you're not as worried about this? Uh, and you know, this is what I'm worried about and why, right. That can very much help you in practice. Uh, like Adkem said, literally in the mirror. Okay in the mirror, uh, daily affirmations. My pain is real. It is valid. Yeah. But like literally just like before an appointment, give yourself a pep talk and say those things out loud. It's really hard to say them in the moment. Uh, and it's much easier if you already have the words that you're going to say, and they just fall out of your mouth. You just open your mouth and they fall out of your face. So much easier. Um, nurse Scott's general rule of the hospital is if you're having a real problem, call the house supervisor, ask to some, talk to someone else's boss. Yes. Nurse Scott has a great video of how to climb the chain of command within a hospital. Um, I will leave it linked down below. Uh, and that is a good way, you know, let me just talk to your boss, you know, um, we'll see. Uh, MSA said, I, um, said, was telling a doctor, I, um, I said, you're blowing me off. Doctor said I was rude and not compliant minutes later, full blown asthma attack. Anesthesiology saved my life by listening. Um, black presenting woman here that is awful. And I am sorry. And this is so unfortunately much more of a problem. Uh, if you are in any way, you know, someone who is, if you're not white and you're not like, you know, I don't know, a white dude <laughs> who is very like clean shaven, clean cut, nicely dressed and polite, there's going to be assumptions about you. Um, going to be much harder if you are, you know, if you dare to have any melanin in your skin, you know, how dare you, um, you're going to have a harder, like, that's just being very honest is like, they're like that. There's so many stereotypes in healthcare. Um, and it's not fair and it sucks. Uh, but that it's so much, Im so important for people to, know how to, again, talk about this because it is an unfair standard. They're going to, you know, uh, expect, you know, different, they're going to present people suck. They have a ton of preconsidered notions and it's going to come out that way. You know what I mean? Um, absolutely awful. I mean, they said, thanks for the tips. Yes. It was very traumatic. I cannot even like literally imagine that was seven months ago. And I started my last semester of nursing school today. Oh my gosh. And then being in healthcare and knowing all of that while you're doing that, that is a mess. And I am sorry now, even more inspired to fight for my patients and their concerns. Oh, my friend, that is a lot. Uh, you're going to be an excellent healthcare provider because of that, but I hope you are getting all sorts of all sorts of help dealing with everything related to that, because that is, that is a lot. Um, that is a lot. Uh, no. Um, Emily Miller says one time I had a patient call me at the PCP's office saying they were at the ER and no one was listening to them. Sorry, bud. I can't really help you. Um, this is interesting. I have called, I've had this exact situation probably five times where a patient in the emergency room called me, their primary care provider said, hi, I'm in the ER and this is my situation. And I said, why didn't you come talk to me about this first? <laughs> Cause some of them, I was like, my dude, just, you should have just come to me. And some of them were very serious. And I literally had to coach them through this encounter of how to, um, you know, <laughs> how to deal with this situation. And it sucked. Uh, it sucked. Uh, you shouldn't need your primary care provider to then be on the phone on speakerphone in the middle of the room and being like, look, 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 here we are. Um, that sucks. 
We don't need that. Um, we don't need that. Um, let me see. Someone else was saying that they might be, um, Oh, operation division, different hospitals have different names of things. Yes, indeed. Um, let me see. I remember Anthony Smith says, I remember when I took my spouse to the ER last week for a small bowel obstruction and severe abdominal pain and the person sitting next to us was there for IV fluids for a hangover. Yeah. Yeah. The ER, there's a lot, right? And this is where I think some of that, the issues also come in of, I'm sure as an ER employee, it is grueling. And if you work in the ER, you can let me know to see so many people misuse the ER, right? That I'm sure after a while, that's not going to be great for your compassion and your assessment skills. It's in no way an excuse, in no way an excuse. I'm just, I see how that would happen. Um, Miller Miller says, part of my job is triage. And when a patient's need the ER, we try to call ahead on their behalf and communicate the concerns and reason for the ER very specifically. Yes. If you are someone who ever sends people to the ER, like in an urgent care or in primary care, please call ahead or have your MA call ahead or something like that. Um, I always tried, I always called ahead if I was sending, if they were in my office and I sent them to the ER via ambulance or via a car, either, um, you know, I would have my MA call the hospital and usually get all the connections, right? Because that takes a bunch of time, just being like very honest. And then once they like, they had the person on the phone, you know, I, I want to talk to, you know, whoever the charge nurse of the ER is, is usually who it was or the whoever, you know, and then they could decide if they needed to talk to a like a provider. Uh, and you would just give them a rundown. Hey, I'm sending over a 43 year old. This is the situation. This is what we've already worked up here. I'm sending her because I'm worried about X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, I just wanted to give you a heads up med like pertinent medical history is this, this is what was described to me. This is what I felt. This is what I saw. It takes like five minutes, literally. Uh, and it was so helpful because a lot of times people, when they got there, they were not able to use their nice little handout that I gave them because if they were going to the hospital after visiting my office, it was probably because they were trying to die. And I didn't appreciate it. So I sent them somewhere else uh, so that that wouldn't happen. And they were not able to articulate very well, which is again, why having someone with you can be very, 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 very helpful. Mr. Midwife says, I sent a patient to the ER yesterday, tried calling ahead and the ER hung up on me. I don't know if you know anything about her. Just send her in. Click. Wow. 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 <laughs> You're making that a uh, job of coming and working with you every day. Chad sound like so much better, <laughs> so much better. That's a mess. Hopefully your hospital isn't like that. That's a mess. Um, no, no, we don't like this. Uh, and let me see. I see a lot of, uh, oh, yeah. Grassroots says, um, I see a lot of lazy doctoring too. doctors who tell everyone to just go to the doctor to the ER when they can't get into the office. Um, that's sad. And also I don't know how people afford that. My people had to be dying to go to even consider it. I like feel like I begged people to go to the emergency room because they're like, if I go and it's not what you think it is, I won't have any money anymore. And I was like, well, if you go, don't go. I'm worried you will die. Uh, and that's also an extra stress that you don't need. Uh, just being very candid, um, as a primary care provider is that knowledge, uh, <laughs> that knowledge that if I don't send you, if I don't convince you, or if I send you and it's not that, and I bankrupt you on accident because of a call that I, you know, like, that's on me. And I've also had that. That's why I don't work in primary care anymore. One of the many reasons is I was sick of having to be that person who decided, am I going to cost you an insane amount of money that you legitimately don't have? Uh, cause then people would come back screaming sometimes I rate, like always educate people, right? Like I, th I'm worried it's this, I can't rule out that it's this. Uh, but I'm worried and I want you to go. Um, and then they would come back and they're like, well, it wasn't that. And I was like, Oh, okay. Yep. That sucks. Um, and I don't think it's cause like, and it just, it was exhausting and awful. Um, and I'm the same way, right? I hate that. That is the first thing that crosses my mind when something happens to people or myself in my family. I'm like, 
is this worth the severe financial consequence that this will bring? I'm like, I unsure. Don't know. Problem. Um, so anyway, that is, that is our situation. My friends, that is where we are here. Um, yeah, it's why it's important to have a crystal ball. And if you don't have one, then you're just honestly pretty screwed in terms of healthcare. And we don't know what to, um, tell you. So that's this very sad, very tragic situation. Um, hopefully some of that was like a little bit helpful and helped you navigate and gave you some language to like stick up for yourself. Uh, if you find yourself in a situation where you feel like you are not being heard, um, remember practice beforehand, we're going to use our who, what, where, and why to describe the situation or have someone else describe it for us. And then say, I don't feel like I'm being heard. And this is why, and why aren't you worried about this? Which will make them hopefully pause and think, wait, why am I not worried about this and reflect? And hopefully that will help. Okay. Hopefully, um, this is a mess. I wish I had anything better to say about this other than this absolutely never should have happened. It is in no way this person's fault or their husband's fault. Uh, everyone deserves to be listened to. They did everything they were supposed to in terms of bringing concerns forth. And this is why I rant so much on the internet is because these situations are happening all the time. And uh, I'm worried it is going to just get worse with like how more and more nurses are quitting. Right. Cause we just, if we have less nurses, right. That's like less people assessing in the ER. If we keep burning out our healthcare people by, uh, valuing, you know, a ton of money over being able to just treat people in primary care or having time, your ER providers are going to leave. They're going to get burned out your, primary care people are going to bounce after three years after thinking I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. And then three years later, you're like, I can't take this emotional toll of my bankrupting my patients. So bye. Um, we got a problem, my dudes, we got a problem and, uh, here we are. So thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for, um, listening. If you have experienced this type of stuff, uh, in terms of like seen it in the ER, seen how it plays out at your healthcare system and you want to talk about it, feel free in the comments. I think we learn from realizing this is more common, right? Because I can talk about this story and say like, oh, I've seen these things. And uh, I know there's a lot of people who are like, oh my gosh, you're just like, it's just dramatic and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's helpful. I think the more we talk about this, the more people realize like this is happening all over and this is not okay because it's always fine until it's someone you love. Right. And I don't want it to be someone you love. I desperately don't want it to be someone that you love. And I don't want you to learn this the hard way. So that's where we are. Um, let me know your thoughts. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Um, I would love to invent an app with helpful resources for patients. I would totally recommend that to my patients. I, uh, would love that. That would be great fun. I have many ideas of things that I would like to do, but I lack the executive function of ADHD to, uh, I lack the executive function to actually get there. So if anyone can cure that for me, that would be great. <laughs> like I have all these ideas and then I can't produce any of them because I get distracted by the fact that my, um, you know, wall has a smudge and then I'm derailed forever and ever, you know, there we are. Um, choosing wisely has some good handouts for discussing, uh, care with patients. Yes. There's lots and lots of good things on the internet. Um, many, many, a good handout. Uh, Canva is also your friend. Canva is where I made all my handouts. Um, most handouts that I have, I have in my NP binder. If you happen to work in primary care, I have a lot of those where I just handed them out to people. Um, but yeah, I would love to make an app. Do you know how to make math? And uh, do you know how to <laughs> I was going to say, do you know how to make apps? But I almost said maps and it almost came out meth. I was like, wow, <laughs> don't tell me if you know how to do that. I'm not a, no, 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 no. And mixed with Neuralia, the D amphetamine, which is like a, a combination of reading and thinking three things at once. I am not, I am not coming to you on the internet for that. <laughs> I am not coming here for that. And executive dysfunction is no joke. It's no joke. <laughs> Oh, we are not. Oh, it is not a joke, even remotely. All right, friends. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you. Leave your thoughts and comments in the description below. I will see you on Friday for a topic I have not planned yet. Again, executive dysfunction is very poor. Um, 
I appreciate you being here. I hope you know that you are not alone. Even though things are crazy, you are more than enough. You deserve healthcare. You deserve to be listened to. Um, and you, my friends, you can do the hard things. You can fight the good fight. Um, if you have other video ideas or comments or things you want me to react to, do let me know. Oh, that's the wrong one. There's a new emoji. If you're a channel member and you need a palate cleanser, that's what that was. We have a palate cleanser. It's soap. And then we will insert a funny story. I was meaning to pull up this. If you have anything you would like me to discuss or talk about, uh, send it to my email right here. And it helps me know what you guys want to hear discussions. Anyway, Midwestern goodbye. Uh, now we're just going to leave abruptly. What's that like an Irish goodbye when we just like bail, we're going to do that now. All right. Bye. Except I said bye, which kind of like ruins it. Man, that stinks. <laughs> that wasn't the goal. That's not what we wanted. Oh, yes. You can email me if you come up with good topics. That's perfect. Wonderful. All right. Bye for real.